How about now? Oh. Really? Yeah. What am I, Billy Joel? <laughs> oh. Oh. Well, this one looks like it's working, but. Hey, Victoria, can you hear me? Hey, maybe not. And can you hear me now? Okay, cool. So now they can hear me. Uh, so as I was saying, yeah, um, want to talk about bringing SQL into JavaScript. And then the other thing that I want to talk about is uh, a little bit about your midterm projects. So <clears throat> building on what was done yesterday, um, you now got access to SQL, which is this pretty powerful tool for being able to work with data. Um, SQL's got way more functionality than you will ever use. And one of the things I can assure you from, from years of, of doing it is that you, the good news is you only ever need to be adequate at SQL. Don't think that it's something that you have to become a true ninja master at and that you have to learn every possible function that's available because you will not use 90% of it 95% of the time. Uh, 
joins um, and some of the aggregates like the group by and the order by, some max min, those kinds of things. That's the majority of what you're going to have to do on a regular basis with uh, you know with the with SQL um, in production. And if you do need that other stuff, that's where Google kicks in. That's where Stack Overflow kicks in when you actually need those more advanced queries. But unless you're going to go become a database admin, which is not a bad job, by the way, uh, you really won't need all that other stuff. So um, <clears throat> what I want to talk about today is how, how we bring in SQL to JavaScript and, and make that connection so that we can now not just run queries from the command line, but run queries from our code and be able to programmatically access that data. Uh, so I'm going to start off and uh, I'm going to show you this database that I have. Um, so I've got a database of hockey players and teams. Um, so if I take a look at what's in teams, um, I've got the 30 teams. I don't have Las Vegas in here. Um, and if I look at what's in players, I got a lot of players. There's like 800 of them or something uh, weird like that. 888. Um, so a lot of data now that we can work with and we can you know, join players and teams. And sure, we can run a lot of queries from the command line, but I want to do it from JavaScript. Um, so first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to set up this folder. Oh, thanks, NPM. Good to know. Um, I'm going to set up this folder with just a, a package.json file, which a lot will allow me to save some dependencies in it. And then all I'm going to need to start off with is just uh, one module to allow JavaScript to talk to Postgres, um, which is going to be npm install pg. Now, there are many npm modules available that allow you to talk to databases. Your mileage may vary. Uh, at the end of the day, I'm going to start off with something basic like PG so that I can really show what's going on behind the scenes. Um, and then if we need to go deeper, we can absolutely do that. Uh, so now I've got this installed. Um, and now what I want to do is I want to start off uh, looking at how I would bring this into my code. Whenever I'm writing a piece of code that's going to be connecting to a database server and querying from it, I'm building a client. So it makes sense that uh, what I'm going to do is bring in PG and call it a client. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'll make new client, uh, and I have to give it the name of the database that I want to connect to. Oops. And so now I have uh, an actual, now I've actually invoked this code, told it to connect to a database, uh, and I have something that I can work with. So let's take a quick peek at this particular module because when in doubt, read the documentation. Um, PG is the node Postgres module. Uh, we can tell that it's popular because it's 334,000 downloads in a week. Um, that's generally a good thing. And basically what it allows us to do is to connect node and Postgres. Um, and in order to get the documentation, we actually have to go to its homepage. Oh, here we go, nodepostgres.com. Good, good URL. Um, and here we have uh, here we have the basic code that I just um, that I just said. Uh, I just specified which database. I didn't take a default database, which is what this one would connect to. So I'm going to make a new variable called client that requires in PG. Uh, I'm going to actually run that method. Uh, then I need to connect to the database. Um, so I'll do that. 
And then what I'm able to do is I'm able to use the query method. I'll blow that up just a little bit. I'm able to use the query method to run queries. Now, you'll notice that um, what's going on here is we have a query that looks weird. Doesn't look like queries you ran yesterday because it's got something bizarre in it. And it's this dollar sign one colon colon text. So this is something that uh, I want to start talking about now as early as possible when we are talking about connecting code to SQL because it will save you thousands of hours of grief in the future. Anyone ever heard of something called SQL injection? Yeah, this is how databases get hacked. Um, and the classic uh, version of this is this XKCD cartoon. And what you have to realize is that by her naming her child this, uh, the Robert quote, parentheses, semicolon, drop table students, semicolon, dash, dash, uh, that's, what, that's what happens with SQL injection, is somebody goes to the login box, for example, or the search box uh, of a website, and instead of just typing in a nice simple username, they type in the username and they add SQL code to the end of it so that it theoretically will run multiple queries instead of just the one that it's supposed to do. Um, because if we have on the back end, we have something like select star from users where username equals, you know, say Bob and password equals fluffy bunny that would look up you know whether there was a user that had that username and password and what you'll typically see is people let's say that you know we with with express you know we did something like const username equals rec.body.username right well you'll see people build the, their queries like this And they'll just take the user's input and they will interpolate it directly into the query. And let's just leave the query at that for right now. So why this is bad is for the exact reason that this points out. Normally, you'd expect username to be something like Don. You know, that would be the username that I would type in. But if I actually do a username that is this, um, you know, let, let's actually say I did this, uh, drop database users, dash dash. Let's say that's what I actually typed in as my username. Then this query very quickly becomes this query. And this works here at the end because anytime in a SQL query you put dash dash, anything after it is considered a comment. And so this is now what I'm sending to my database to run. Guess what happens to my user's database? Gone, table, done. You know, actually, this is drop database, you know, so this would drop everything. Um, so this would be bad. And this is how SQL injection works, is extra SQL code gets added into web inputs. Uh, now, the nice thing is if we go back to this documentation and we look at how this works, let's actually look at this whole thing here uh, of what's going on. The way the PG NPM module works and the way most robust professional 
database libraries work is they do something called a parameterized query, which is a terribly technical term for saying that they allow you to put placeholders in the string of the query that the code will then sanitize some field before replacing that placeholder. So what's going to happen here is PG is going to take the string hello world and it's going to make sure that there are no SQL command characters in there at all and then it will replace this as text. So that's what it will do. And that's called a parameterized query. And different database libraries do it different ways. But it is absolutely 10,000% the best practice for making sure that your database queries are safe before you run them. Not using parameterized queries is simply lazy. Uh, and that's not a, a judgment on any of you personally until I see you do it. Then I'll judge you personally. Um, yeah, parameterized queries absolutely are the best practice. Uh, and what's nice here is you can have dollar sign one up to dollar sign zero, so you can have 10 placeholders in one query. Uh, and then the colon colon text, what that allows you to do is it allows you to specify the type of data that should be going in in that particular place. Um, we could do just dollar sign one and get whatever we get. Uh, it would still be parameterized, but this allows us to be a little more explicit, which is a good thing. So <clears throat> you'll see that, uh, that kind of thing a lot. Uh, if we look at some queries, so here's parameterized queries. Uh, we've got the text, which is insert into users, name and email, values, dollar sign one, dollar sign two, returning star. Our values are Brian C and Brian.m.carlson at gmail.com. So Brian C is going to go in as dollar sign one and Brian.m.carlson at gmail.com is going to go in as dollar sign two. And uh, because of the way this works, client.query, there's the text, there's the values, that query will automatically be built properly for us before it's run. Then what we have is we have a callback. And this callback is important to know uh, because it follows a node principle uh, that is a, actually a pretty strong JavaScript principle, which is what we call an error first callback. And this is a just a design pattern that you will see about 86 gazillion times between now and the time you stop using JavaScript, where you have a callback that is in response to some asynchronous function, and the first parameter that is passed to that callback is an error object. Uh, and then typically your data is the second parameter after that. So this is the error, this is the result of the query. And we're going to test if there's an error, then we will log out that error object. Otherwise, we're going to log out stuff about that row, uh, about that result. So this is a very standard pattern that we would that we would want to have. So let's actually watch this in action. Uh, so we've connected. Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, select star from. Let's let's do teams. That'll be shorter. Uh, oh, here's one thing to note, because I was just about to do this and make this mistake. Uh, we don't need the semicolon on the end of the on the end of the query, um, and we don't have any values. Uh, so I can just run client dot query query, and then I set up my callback. And if we have an error. I will do that else console.log and let's just look at the response object that we get. Um, in fact, let's give ourselves a little bit more.
So now we have just a little bit more context to which one of these is running. And all I have to do is run node index.js. And I get stuff back. So if I scroll up here, we get yay, it worked. So that means we made the connection, we ran the query, no errors were generated. Yay. Uh, and I get a result object back. It tells me that my command was a select. It tells me the row count. Um, so there's 30 rows that have come back. And then I have this key rows. And rows holds an array that looks like it has a whole bunch of data in it. That's good to know. Uh, and then there's fields. And so it looks like each one of the fields here, ID, city, and name, is represented in the fields. Um, column IDs, data type IDs, bunch of stuff that I don't really understand nor need to. Uh, there are parsers that are in there that come back um, and a couple of other fields. What matters to me is the data. That's what, I, that's what I queried for, that's what I want, that's in rows. That's the standard way that the data is going to come back. So now that I know that, now I can change this just a bit, and I can just log out res.rows. Run this again, and there's my array of, of rows, yay, it worked. Um, so that's, that's good. That uh, gives me something to work with. Uh, the other way that I could do this if I wanted to is I could do this with a promise. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, and then I would use dot then as, the, as scheduling the callback for dealing with the results and dot catch to deal with the, the error if it were to come up. And whether you are doing the callback version or the promise version or the async await version, it doesn't matter. What matters is that you know what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, not, there's not one of those three that's going to be a best practice. Um, don't use async await just because it's new and cool. Because if you don't understand what it's doing, you'll get yourself into trouble. Um, so, uh, the next thing I wanted to show you guys, was it the real mode? No. Oh, I know what the next thing was I wanted to show you guys. So, now we've been able to make a basic query. Um, you know, and if we really wanted to, uh, we could do something here where, um, you know, res dot rows dot for each team console dot log, um, you know, city, uh, and we could do team dot city. You know, just to demonstrate that we can work with the data. You know, we can do that. That's pretty straightforward, pretty easy. Um, but that's just me doing a select star from table. Uh, what if I wanted to look up, for example, Vancouver? Now, slightly different query, and I need to treat it a slightly different way. Um, so let's comment this out. And now we're going to think about what the query is going to be. Select star from teams where city equals. And here is where I'm going to have a $1 text. Oops. So that's going to be my query. And I'm going to automatically parameterize it. Um, and my values is I'm going to have an array, and I'm going to put one thing in there that's going to be Vancouver. And so now what I'm running is client.query. I'm going to pass it the query. I'm going to pass it the values, and then I give it the callback. And so what will happen uh, if it gets the values as this second parameter, then it will uh, Take this first one and put it in where dollar sign one is, and it will put it in just as straight text. 
and console.log res.rows. And I get an error because cannot read property rows of undefined because I broke something. Yay. So what happens when you don't test for the error? see what I broke. Uh, bind message supplies one parameters, but prepared statement requires zero. Really? Oh, I know why. I think I know why. I think that's why. I think I put extra quotes around it. Let's see if that was why. Yep, that was why. My fault. So now I've been able to run this and I logged out res.rows and note that this is a case where I got one result back, but it still came back in an array. My rows are always going to be an array no matter what. <clears throat> so uh, I can change my query just a little bit. Limit dollar sign two, and I can pass another parameter into my query. See if that changes things a bit. Nope, I still get an array back. Don't try and fight the array. Is is kind of the message here. The array is a good thing because it standardizes the way the data is coming back to you uh, and doesn't give you inconsistent results. Just know that you're with the PG gem, you're always going to get an array back. And then if you actually wanted to get access to that data, you would just have to do that. And then I get an object, which I can then you know address the city and the name. <clears throat> so, um, the cool thing about this is now that we know that we can do this, uh, we can start to build something cool around it, uh, get team by city. So now I can do that. Oh, sorry, you're right. Well, actually, uh, I liked city, and let's do that. That makes a lot more sense. <clears throat> and now I can get team by city and pass in Vancouver and get the same results back. Now, I'm starting to build functionality that is business logic around whatever data I happen to have. Um, <clears throat> and that opens the door for me to start doing some really cool stuff. It is. So this is the this would be the second parameter. The one here uh, is going to go into dollar sign two, and that was just me showing that even if I try and limit the result set, I'm still I'm still going to get back an array. But the other thing is any query that you are going to do where you know that your intention is to only get one result back, you can actually speed up the query. I mean we're talking microseconds here, but you can speed up the query by putting limit one on the end of it. Um, so that's actually a neat trick that you can use. Uh, for example, login, which you will write uh, about 100 million logins in your life. Um, so anytime you're doing that, you know, select star from users where username is blah, limit one. Because the intention is that you only, there should only be one user with that email address or that credential. And so uh, you just always add that as a nice way to just micro speed up that query uh, because it allows SQL to reduce the result set that it's going to give you back. Therefore, there's less data being transacted. 
Bingo. And I can have up to 10 of them, uh, 1 to 0. Yeah, <clears throat> no problem. So if I'm able to do this now, now I can start doing this. Um, so I'll take in a parameter that is the team, and I can start to build my query. So select star, uh, well, we actually need to take a quick peek at our data. Um, so our players table has the player name, and then there is a team ID, which is good. Uh, position, games played, like that's all the, this is now all the player data. Uh, but the team ID is going to be useful for us because we want to be able to do kind of a join situation so that if I pass in a team, let's say the Canucks, um, then I want to be able to return the list of players that play on that team. So given that this is my start, how would I build this query? Get to test your skills from yesterday. Uh-huh. What am I going to join teams on? Teams.id equals players.teamid. Uh, no, because then ID would, uh, so the question is, can I just do ID equals team underscore ID? ID is ambiguous because both players and teams have an ID. Yeah. Uh, do I need a where clause here? Yes. Where teams.name equals dollar sign one text, because that's what I'm going to pass in. And my values is going to be team. Client.query, query, values, callback. If error, console.error. Uh, error stack just gives you the stack trace of, of what, because the error object itself is freaking gigantic. Uh, so the error.stack just gives you the stack trace of what caused the error. Um, and generally, although it's not in the examples, I will return after doing that uh, uh, because I, rather than doing an if else, I'll do an if return. Um, that's my pattern. It works. Doesn't If else works just fine. I personally just don't like the look of if else. So I write it this way. It's fine. Works either way. Um, so here, uh, then what I'm going to do is say uh, res.rows.foreach and let's just say player and uh, res.rows.foreach um, player uh, player.name plays player.position I think that's what it was And so that'll just iterate through and spit that out for each player. Um, and then I can call get players by team and I don't know, somebody give me a team. Hmm? Okay. Boring. See if it works. Hello? Oh, that was dumb. Anybody know what I did wrong? Nope. <laughs> yep. 
helps if you actually output things. Sorry, Victoria. So that's interesting. That's not what we expected. <laughs> we got the right position here, um, <clears throat> but we didn't get what we uh, were anticipating for this. Hmm. I wonder why that happened. Let's look at what we're getting back. Yep. Now the great part <clears throat> is figuring out why it would do that. Uh, there's something else that's, that's particular here. Um, every single one of them has the same ID. So the same ID is there, the same team ID is there. Name is set to Canucks. City is set to Vancouver. But I don't remember seeing a city field over here on players. I am joining with the teams table. So question becomes, how do we fix this? Don't select star, yeah. Uh, we know in this particular case that there's very specific fields that we want back. So let's select those. Hmm? And now when we do that, oh, that's different. That suddenly looks like good data. So this is an interesting thing that, um, oh wow, I just realized this is from the beginning of last year because it's got Brock Bezer in it. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, so this is an interesting thing that PG does that most libraries won't do. Um, is it does something, and I'll, I'll show it to you here in Sublime uh, so that you see what's going on. So let's say that we have this object name, Bob, and position, right wing. <clears throat> and let's say that we have this other object that's name Canucks, city, Vancouver. So we've got two objects here, and they both have a field that has the same key. Um, <clears throat> let's call this one player. Let's call this one team. This is effectively what's going on behind the scenes to generate the result set. Uh, do you know what object.assign does? Cool. Object.assign does something really neat. It is, uh, it is a way to... Effectively what happens is object.assign will take pretty much an infinite number of arguments uh, and they should all be objects. Everything in JavaScript is an object, so that gets easy. So typically what you do is you start off with an empty object. And then what object.assign does is it looks at the second one and goes through all of the keys on the second object. Any keys that exist on the first object, it replaces the value with the value from the second one. Any keys that don't exist on the first object get set on it. Um, so then we have a new object that is those two having been munged together. So then it takes the third object, and again, any keys that are on the result of these two, uh, where the key is th the same as on this one, it takes the value from the last one. Any keys that don't exist, 
it sets them on there. So effectively what happens is we go from having an empty object, we start off with this, then we get this, and then we get this. That's what we end up with. Now, this is just a quirk of the PG module, is, is the fact that it creates its results by doing this. Most other ORMs, uh, object relational mappers, uh, or database libraries or things like that will not do this the same way. Um, this one is unique in that it does this. Uh, so the way that we, you know, if we don't want this particular behavior, we just get really specific about what comes back. And then it works. Uh, so that's, that's why we saw that other behavior and now when we look at what's coming back, we have the name and position as we expected them. Um, and I can go back to doing what I wanted to do, which was this. And now I have access to the data that I expect. So that gets us to the point where we now can make queries and we can even pass data into functions that we can create that will query specific fields for us. Uh, if we change this and just, uh, just to demonstrate that it works, different set of players. So um, now you can think about actually having this script be something where I would like, you know, run the script, pass in something from the command line, or maybe it comes in from a web input, or maybe it's something pulled from an API, and then I'm able to go to my grab that team name, go to my database, and look it up. And that's that's useful. Any questions so far? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so this will only happen when you are joining two tables uh, if the two tables have fields of the same name. Yeah. Yes. This yeah, so yes, this is undesirable. Um it I don't know why they chose to do this. Personally, I think it's destructive. Yeah, totally. I mean ID for example. It, kind of, yeah, kind of important. Um you know, and, and also fields like, you know, named things like name or uh even stuff like, you know, city, location, position. You know, those could have, you know, position could be CEO, position could be number two, because it's the second position in a list. So having it stomp on that data is a bit of a, a pain in the butt. Um, but that's the default behavior. And so the way around it is just to, to select fields specifically. Yeah. Um, honestly, being explicit with SQL is never a bad thing. Um, it, it's kind of hard to get too specific. Because uh, select star, for example, we saw that we were getting a bunch of data back that we didn't need. So if you don't need the data, don't even bother selecting it. Um, and this just, you know, optimizes things a little bit further for you. Right. Oh, yeah. Biggest rock is best rock. Yeah. Yeah. But that's where you... Right. Yeah, uh, the, that's that's why working iteratively and stopping and pausing and looking at what is coming back uh, each with each query, rather than just blindly accepting it, is definitely your best practice. Um, yeah, I, I will never ever build a query for production that I haven't run once at least. Like I've probably run it in the SQL console, then I've put it into my code. I've you know console dot logged out the results, and then I've started to build business logic around displaying it or parsing it the way I wanted to. Just, yeah, just to make sure that I have actually what I want. Even if it's the dumbest thing like select star from users. You know, I'm gonna make sure that I'm getting back the data I expect. Because uh, I could be connected to the wrong database. You know, I could be getting a different set of users back. So, you know, I always wanna have that, that sanity check rather than just quite frankly assuming. Yeah. So if you wanted to um, build that yeah. Would you just 
just specify that with like um, players dot id. Uh, so yeah, if, if I wanted this, the same field from both tables, uh, what I'd probably do is I'd use as in that case to give them aliases. So I'd do like players.id as player underscore ID, teams.id as team underscore ID. So that way the, the actual key names of the object that's coming back would be different for the two of them. Cool. All right. Let's, uh, let's take a break. Come back in 10 minutes. Yeah. Dot length. Yeah. I could. Uh, I can also think about the fact that every time I get a result object back from PG, one of the things I see is a row count property. So I can just use that. Yeah. So that way I don't have to run any extra methods. It's, that number is just given to me. Not, well, if you're joining, yeah, yeah, uh, but yeah, that way, like, I'm going to get a row count back from uh, from PG automatically, so I can just use that. Pardon? The alias, yeah, the alias would create a different key name. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, because if I go in. Uh, let's say I do players.id as player ID, just for example. Uh, and let's actually log out the results this time. I get that. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> cool. That's that's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> well, Joel did say. Okay, so <clears throat> to take this one step further, or more like three steps further, uh, now that we have a good idea of what the pattern looks like for building functions around database queries, 
I want to make this very procedural top to bottom script that I have here more node like and and talk about how we would properly structure this in the context of a node app. So one of the things that is coming up here as a pattern is that I'm making these utility functions for doing specific tasks and then I call the function, pass some data to it. It builds the query, builds the values, runs the query, does some stuff. So this is starting to be very repetitive, very wet code. Um, so I want to start breaking this down into modules to dry this out just a bit. Uh, so one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to make for myself a db.js. And I'm going to take all of my database stuff and I'm going to put it there. So now I have one module that's just going to deal with making a connection to my database and giving me that connection object back that I can then use to query. So now that I have that in place, the other thing is, well, I've got all these utility functions I'm building. Sounds like I need to give it its own library. So I'm going to make a file called hockey.js. Now this one is the one that's actually going to be doing the database queries. So I need my database module that I just built. And then what I need to do is grab all of these functions that I built. And I need to paste them all in here. And now I have all these functions in here. And I just have to remember what they're all called. Get teams, get team by city, and get players by team. Okay. Get team by city, get players by team. Uh, the other thing I need to do is I just need to change client to DB because that's easier. Uh, one thing I've added to the end of each query is db.end um, because that uh, will actually close the connection and, and stop the script because otherwise that connection stays open as long as you want it to so that you can keep making queries against that database. So dot .connect opens my connection and dot .end closes my connection. So at the end, once I'm done doing each thing, I call db.end. Um, and that means over here, I would need require hockey. Uh, and so this becomes hockey.getTeams, hockey.getTeamByCity, and hockey.getPlayersByTeam. I did name all of them correctly. And now I want to test to make sure that this all works. Ta-da, it does, which is nice. Because now I've broken things down into some modular pieces. And if I need to add more abilities to my hockey library, I just go to that file, I add another function, I export it, I have access to it in my main script. Um, and my database stuff doesn't change. But now, now that I have that database uh, library run, running the way it is, theoretically I could pick that up and move it to any other project that I now have a connection to my hockey. Uh, database. If I parameterized it a little bit, like made a function to actually uh, create the new client and connect to it, then I could, um, you know, I could even pass in the name of a database and have this generic, I can connect to any database uh, function at that particular point if I really wanted to. Um, again, which is nice. Uh, but let's look at hockey.js here because the other thing that I want to point out 
is that <clears throat> we've got um, we've got wet code inside this file because every single time what we do is we run a function we build a query and then we call db.query and uh, we test for an error and then we we do something after it so what we want to do now is uh, see if we can abstract this out just a little bit so what I'm going to propose is that we have a function called run query and it's going to take query and it's going to take values and what we're going to do Uh, and actually, there's one more thing. Sorry, I lied. We're going to take a callback function. We're going to call the callback function on res.rows. And then we're going to call db.in. So now, what that means is we can change this. We can get rid of all of these things. And we can call run query. We have no values. Um, and our callback function is this thing. Now that's a lot cleaner to work with. And in fact, if we change this, we know that we're going to get the res.rows passed in. So we know we're getting the data passed in. We get to do that. Now we have our own design pattern that we've set up for working with our database. So that now in any of these cases, We don't have to keep repeating this stuff. And we're going to run query, query, values, data. And what we're doing is console.log, data, zero. That gets a lot easier to maintain as a function, too. And then when we have a slightly bigger one, like this one down here, get to get rid of all this stuff. Run query, query, values, data. And there we go. A lot easier to deal with now. And run query doesn't get exported because we never need access to that method directly. We're building layers around that so that we build specific queries, like these pre-prepared queries that we're just plugging data into as we need it. And then it works. That way we don't have to keep rewriting the same if error, log this out, return false, blah, blah, blah. Like we don't have to keep rewriting that over and over and over again. We don't have to keep rewriting to close the database connection every single time. We've got a nice pattern here, this function that we can just use as our workhorse anytime we need it. And 
we can then test Um, and let's change it to the Flames, just because I want to see a new list of players. Womp womp. Oh, because I killed the connection. So I can only run one of these methods at a time. Okay. That's my fault. But, to start off with, get teams worked. Uh, you'll notice that all the console.logs ran, and then I got the first set of results. Yay for asynchronous. So that's my fault. But uh, yeah, I killed the connection at the end of the first query, so I can't run the second query. I can only, um, yeah. I can only run one at a time the way I have it built right now. So. How would you change that? How would you fix this so that I can potentially run more than one query at a time. Well, I, w I can do that, but watch what happens. And this is something you may not have noticed was happening earlier. So, our teams, there's looking up the team by the city, and there's looking up all the players on the flames. But what's happening right now? Just waiting. So I have to control C to kill it. That's what happens when I get rid of db.in. Yes, I solve I solved the first problem, but I created another problem in the process. So let's for the moment put that back here. There are about 16 right answers to this question, by the way. What else can I do? Totally. Um, so I can do this. Uh, so db.end is, is there. Uh, I would export this one. Nope, because it doesn't see the database. I can't call db.end in the index.js because it doesn't see db at all. Yeah, I then have to expose the database object to that one, and that kind of defeats the purpose. But I can make myself a function for it. And then I can do that if I actually call it correctly. So now I've run all my queries, I'm done. <clears throat> and um, oh, why did that happen? It's asynchronous. So I can't quite do that the way that I want to. Because, yeah, that closed it immediately before any of the other queries ran. Thoughts? Um, uh, it, well, there are, yeah, there's a couple options here. None of them are particularly good, actually. 
Uh, I was interested to see where you guys were going to go. Um, I could pass a parameter to run query that is, you know, run and then close as a Boolean, have it default to false. But on my last query, I can have it, yeah, I can pass true to that. Uh, but then I'm, I'm kind of stuck with always having that one query as the last query that I'm able to run. I can't reorder them ever. Um, I, that actually is one of the things I could do is I could open a new connection every time uh, and then close it at the end of the, of the thing. And that um, is probably uh, the best way to handle this. And if we do that, oh, nope. Wow, I really didn't like that. Client has already been connected. You cannot reuse a client. Oh, really? Wow. Jerks. Um, yeah, this would normally be how I would solve this problem, but apparently I'm not allowed to do that. Uh, so let's actually look at the documentation for connecting. Um, <laughs> so you can configure a pool of, uh, of connections or a client doesn't really help documentation on this is kind of well what's the word I'm looking for shit yeah it doesn't doesn't really help uh, if we look at pooling you'll want to use a connection pool Oh, so once the pool gets created, then basically what you're able to do is, yeah, you're able to connect it. Uh, it gives you a client, which you can then release at the end of each one. So that's how we would do that. That's a nice... Uh, you must always return the client to the pool if you successfully check it out, regardless of whether or not there was an error with the queries you ran on the client. If you don't check in the client, your application will leak them, and eventually your pool will be empty forever, and all future requests to check out a client from the pool will wait forever. Basically, they might as well just put in big red text, you are a bad programmer, and you should just feel bad. That's basically what they are saying. to shut down a pool called pool.end, okay. Cool, so that's how we would handle that. You know, with a real, a full web app, if we were just using PG, um, then it would be, it would be this. This afternoon, we're gonna see a new library called Connex, uh, and Connex manages this for you. Um, and so Connex has a little bit more magic in it as far as being able to run queries and, and manage this kind of stuff. So we'll see it actually behave a bit differently. <clears throat> but uh, for now, uh, understanding what's going on under the hood with just the native PG module is useful, although somewhat dumb.
Yep. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, the short answer is yes, you could. Uh, the longer answer is, is it's not exactly a best practice to do that. Uh, Victoria, if you're not, if you didn't hear the question, um, he was outlining what the structure of Twitter was with the data helpers uh, library having an exported DB object that you're able to call. Um, whenever we're working with databases, we want to deal in what we call abstractions. So theoretically, uh, from the viewpoint of this file right here, it should not matter whether I am talking to a Postgres database, a Mongo database, a SQLite database, a CouchDB database, should not matter. I should just be able to run these functions, get the data back that I expect. Um, so that's, that's the abstraction. That's that distance between what my business logic is doing and what uh, is actually happening behind the scenes to do that data fetching. Uh, and even with this one here, like this is kind of uh, more closely tied to it being SQL because I'm building SQL queries. For it, but again, this could be Postgres, this could be SQLite, this could be MySQL. Shouldn't matter at this point. Um, so, where where that particular pattern that you're describing from Twitter breaks down is it brings the database querying all the way up to the front part of the code, uh, and then you are completely tightly coupled, tied to having to write Mongo queries in the front part of your server, uh, as opposed to having a library which is just taking care of the magic behind the scenes. Um, one of the things you'll hear said is some variation of tools should be partnerships, not negotiations, uh, which basically speaks to the idea that when you're writing your code, like your actual application, you should only ever have to focus on the business logic part, like the part that actually makes your application be cool. Stuff like this, you know, maybe you write it once, but then you get to forget about it. Uh, and that's why I built a run query method. I just want a method that I can call, give it a query, and it gives you back data. That's all I want. Um, and uh, uh, that's, that's great for me because then I don't have to keep rebuilding that. I don't have to worry about the database logic plus the application logic. I can just focus on what I want my app to do. That's kind of the, the dream we're chasing whenever we're building and starting to modularize and getting more complex apps. And especially like tomorrow when you guys start on your midterms, um, as much of this stuff like connects will help you out a lot because it keeps a lot of this stuff packed away and you don't have to think about it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. Um, and that actually leads us, especially because of what time it is, uh, into talking just a little bit about the midterm project. So later today, um, the teams will come out. Uh, we're probably going to end up with three teams, given the number of people. Um, and the teams are assigned to mimic what you're going to experience when you go out into the world and you end up having to work with people that you don't necessarily get to pick. Like this isn't grade three dodgeball on the backfield where you get to pick a team. Um, and the other thing you're going to find is that there are a list of seven projects and you will be picking one of those. Uh, treat it, one of the things I want to encourage you to do is to treat it like client work. Like a client has assigned you to do this project and you're responsible for delivering it at the top of your ability up to this point. Um, rather than treating it like, say, not that you didn't treat Twitter seriously, but now that you're having to collaborate, um, one of the things that works quite well is to just hold each other to a high standard. Uh, and that will push everyone in the team to, to rise, uh, which is a great thing, because now you have a chance to spend five days working on all the skills and techniques that you may or may not be great at that you've learned over the past three and a half weeks. Um, you know, you get to put together the front-end skills, the back-end skills, the database skills, 
and you get to put it all together into one effort, uh, and you've got five days to do it. And five days seems like a long time, like in boot camp years, that's almost a semester of university, but uh, it's gonna pass really quickly, and especially because there's a weekend, and weekends tend to promote um, beer and beaches and, and those kinds of things. So uh, keep in mind that this weekend is one that you're probably going to want to focus a lot on your project. Um, you're going to have an off week coming up, you know, the week after, so you're going to have time to rest and recuperate. This weekend is a time to really push forward and, and work really hard to deliver your best work. Uh, tomorrow you will have a lecture that is focused on project planning uh, that's going to cover a lot of the, the things that you need to think about before you start writing code. Um, and I just want to give you the caution, um, even when you get your teams tonight, even if your team la uh, latches on to what you want to build tonight, don't start writing code. You're not ready to write code yet. There are a lot of things that you need to think about and consider before you just jump and start throwing hands on keys. Um, and and it, will, it will make a big difference if you think through those things um, ahead of time. Uh, does anybody have any questions about the midterm or how it works? Yeah. Yeah, you'll still have lecture. Yeah, Thursday, Friday will be, you'll have lectures both days. Um, and then, yeah, the rest of the day, the lab time is just working on your midterms. Next Wednesday, yes. As far as I know, please don't quote me on that. I, they don't tell me these things, I just work here. Uh, honestly, the thing is, since I haven't been here for three weeks, I have an email somewhere deep in the unread pile in my inbox that I haven't been able to get to yet, which outlines all of that stuff, and I don't have the answers, Davey will 100% be the person to ask. So. Uh, but yeah, next week will be chaos. Uh, <laughs> which actually makes, in one way, makes me happy because on Wednesday, the day that we move, I'm flying to Japan. So the path to inner peace is four words, not my freaking problem. Uh, we, we, but the flip side is, you know, now I have no control over where I get to sit in the new place. Eh. So, trade-off. Um, yeah, so I, I'm, as far as I know, we're presenting here on Monday, uh, and that the move is not happening until the first on Wednesday, but double-check with Davey, uh, and I'm sure he'll have more details on that coming out over this week. Yeah. Any questions about the database stuff? Any questions about JavaScript? Any questions about banana bread? Like anything up to this point? Yep. Would it be better just on your exports? So, uh, so the question is: Is it better when I'm doing my when I'm exporting my functions? to do module.exports and have an object with just all my functions in them. Uh, is there a difference? Um, it looks different. Um, it honestly comes down to style. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, it honestly comes down to style and, and how you like organizing things. Um, the one challenge to doing it that way is then uh, run query is, you know, I'd have to put that outside my module.exports object that I'm building. Um, that would be the only thing that would be, you know, that's still going to be a standalone function. Uh, at the end of the day, as long as it has, you know, the functions you're building have the scope that they need, it doesn't really matter how you do it. Yeah. I mean, I could also write a function that has a whole bunch of functions inside of it and then export that function and then run that function when I... Like when you know when I export at the other place, how you do it is uh, you know for closure or scope or whatever principle you want to to do. At that point, it's just a, a yeah muscle memory and design pattern. As long as it works, yeah, working code is worth more than pretty code. So. Cool, Victoria. How you, how you guys doing? Do you have any questions?
right? Uh, okay, so in this particular example, I would basically only be able to run one function at a time. Yeah. Uh, so in that case, if I'm using just the client connect um, from the PG library, I would have to worry about that. Um, if I'm using a pool, I'd, I'd have to rewrite some of, the, some of my database logic. But in using a pool, then I'm able to check out a client, run my query, release that client at the end of the callback, um, and I'm good. And I can just keep, I can run as many functions as I want. Uh, so it really, I just have to add a couple lines of logic into run query to check out a new client from the pool, because the pool would then be what would be exported from the database module. Uh, and so I would check out a new client from the pool, run my query, release my client. And uh, then as long as I did that every time and run query, I'm good. That would, that would be the, the better way to handle this using just the PG module. But again, this afternoon when we get to connects, it gets easier. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's good to know how it works. Um, it, very good to know how it works. And it kind of follows the principle that I talked about about three weeks ago when I said that we're always going to make you do it the hard way first uh, so that when the easy way comes along, you understand what's going on under the hood. It's very good to know how that works and what, you know, what the mechanics are. But it's also good to use the nice, easy way that keeps you from having to do all the heavy lifting. Make sense? Yeah. Like, you know, it's great to know how to change the oil in your car, and it's even better to be able to afford to pay somebody else to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, I will package this code up and send it out along with the links to the documentation, uh, and I'll send you the link to the Bobby Tables uh, comic as well. Cool. Go away. <laughs>